All through the record that we've been given, God has been careful to keep for himself a testimony, a record of the things that he's done on, on the earth in regard to men. Uh, all of his deeds that he's done, he's kept a record of these things. There'll be a testimony. And so he's had men who would, he, that would rise up. And, they, and through, that, through these men, they, they've uh, kept a record and a testimony for God. Jeremiah is one of those. And um, he gives this word, and let me read it to you. Since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto, the, unto this day, uh, I, I have even sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, daily, rising up early and sending them. And he said this, But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsel and the imaginations of their evil heart, and went backward and not forward. Now, uh, at least eight times throughout this period of, of time, beginning, I, I suppose, that when they, uh, people were delivered from Egypt, there's eight times that I found, there may be more, that uh, God made us char uh, categorically stated this about his efforts to speak to the people of God. And so these things God has kept for a record for himself. And, and uh, this is the assessment, see, God has had of the people, and it's been written down. You know, and God is still, God is still raising up men early, before the last day, uh, declaring the relevant message of God. He's still doing this. In the long succession of men God has raised up, they've all been quite capable of uh, reciting the works of God and, and rehearsing before us the things that God has done, his great acts uh, among men. Uh, tonight I want to bring your attention to one of these men. His name is Stephen. One of the finest sermons ever preached and in in we have in the scriptures was preached by Stephen. Stephen was one of the seven, as you remember, who was appointed by the assembly to free the apostles to the work that Jesus had given them to do. And you don't hear that much. I didn't I did ever hear that much about Stephen uh, in, the, in the modern church. And, and, and I've, I've decided that's because we really don't have a place for our Stephens in the modern church today. Uh, when the... But, uh, you know, when Stephen preached and around, uh, he caught the ear of the prominent religious leaders. And they could not resist the wisdom and the spirit by which uh, Stephen spoke. So they made up lies and accusations uh, that were not true about him. And uh, these false accusations finally landed him before the high priest. And the high priest asked Stephen, he said, are these things true that they're saying about you? Now, Stephen being led by the spirit... He didn't attempt to defend himself. He, he saw an opportunity now to preach to him. So he, uh, he, he preached to uh, the high priest and all around. He gave an account of the things of God. And this is an example, you bro uh, brethren, how Amen. being familiar with God and the ways of God. He'll be your answer, the opposition. Uh, Opposition you'll meet, it'll be answered even to the temptation of Satan. If you know the ways of God, what Stephen did was to recount the things that God had done, okay? Beginning where he began and went through, you know, the sermon. And he drew kingdom conclusions and he opened them up. And the Spirit used this message, see, to convict their hearts. So, you know, this story is in Acts 6. And actually, Stephen begins his sermon at 15 verse, and it goes all the way through the next uh, chapter. I think it's 50 verses. And then in the end, uh, they drag Stephen out and stoned him for his words. So this is a marvelous example we have of Stephen. Now, uh, I want to bring this attention, uh, bring Stephen to your attention uh, because Stephen was chief among the people who was not an apostle. Yet the Spirit of God worked in him to the same purpose, the edification of the saints. He was called into the ministry of God, just as all the saints of God are. He was appointed along with six others, you remember, to distribute the collections among the widows who were being uh, overlooked. And uh, that's what he was asked to do. That's what he was selected to do. But look what this led up to. And you know, when was it that you began to see and you learn that whatever state you're in, that God was there directing it. Can you pinpoint that time? And I mean really. You know, and from that point on, you begin to look for God 
into situations yeah. and to see how he was working out. In the past, I'll admit, I've lost a many of good things from the Lord because uh, I didn't have a heightened awareness of him. And I wasn't really looking for, you know, you can get to looking at the problem and the situation and you're not looking for how God is working in this. Uh, I've learned, I've learned though, and I'm learning more all the time that in every circumstance, God is there. Amen. Whether it's in times of plenty or in need, when you're sick or well, whether you're distressed or jubilant, there are blessings of God to be had and they're waiting for you. There is something to be seen of God when we're lacking when we're sick and distressed. So because the ground of our belief, brethren, that God is good to his people. That's the basis. Of, that's the baseline, that God is good to his people. He's good to the saints because we have aligned ourselves with his son and we're willing to follow him till the death. For the saints, no matter our situation, no matter our situation, God has goodness and blessing. Job said, Yea, though he say, slay me, yet will I trust him. Because Job was convinced of the goodness of God and, and it's directed at those who love him. Now, this is our text. Sarah has read it for us. And I will briefly read it again to make it fresh in your mind. Therefore, will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you? Therefore, he, he, will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you? For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are they that wait for him. Isaiah was speaking to the people of God, and he said, Blessed are they that wait for him, that wait for God. In the early part of the same verse, in verse 7, God told the people through uh, Isaiah, their strength is to sit still. And uh, our strength, Amen. my strength is to be seen and be waiting on God. And that takes a lot of strength yep. to wait on God because the flesh doesn't want to wait on nothing. Right. See, so you, uh, your, your strength will be to wait for him. And, and as we move in accordance to our faith, God will direct our path. And he will open a door. And he, he will get his truth out. Uh, he'll take care of that. He will manifest and he'll magnify his name. Uh, you know, the best that we can do sometimes is just to assist God in this. Uh, working with God. It's a co-laborers with God. You know, Abraham and Sarah and, uh, was working with God as co-laborers. We was, uh, talked about this this week. And uh, it was already in my... Uh, for plan for me to say, but you know that uh, God didn't reprimand Abraham and Sarah and and, uh, and Hagar and their attempts to have a child of promise. They had not disobeyed God. That God had given Abraham uh, no details, as we had already discussed, and they were just supporting the promise of God. They were reaching out, you see, and involving themselves uh, in faith according to what God had given them to know. So they were. They were co-laborers with God in this. Now, the religious world, you see, they can't claim to be doing the same thing because we've been given the details in salvation. We've been given the details in Jesus Christ, you see. Uh, while waiting on God, he will direct our path, so we, we wait on him. Now, you remember when God delivered uh, his firstborn out of Egypt? He not only took care of the big work, which was creating in the Egyptians a desire for the people to leave, he also made arrangements for the journey across the wilderness. He took care of that too. Now, part of this was the willingness of the Egyptians to give to their former slaves everything practically they had. Uh, the Egyptians loaded the people down with all their wealth and, uh, when they left the land, and God did this. So, blessed are them. Blessed are they that wait on the Lord. Now, in Genesis 49, once again, we're confronted with the nature of faith. The manner in which faith will enable the saints to depart from this life. Uh, in the last three chapters, it's the account of that book. In the last three chapters, it's the account of Jacob's death and his burial. You remember? Uh, you can see in this account the, how faith will enable the saints to die. That's, that's one of the subtopics of that is to see how a man of faith will die. He will, he'll, he'll have peace enough in his death to remember those he's leaving behind. Jacob sent word to his sons, and he told them, Gather uh, yourselves together that I may tell you which shall befall you in the last days. In the last days. Uh, this scene is Jacob's a parting benediction. 
Jacob's last words to his sons. For at the close of the blessings on them, you'll remember the scriptures say that he gathered up his feet unto the bed, yielded up the ghost, and he was buried with his fathers. This was at this time that Jacob had a message for each of his sons. Jacob's blessings would serve as a characterization of who his sons had become and also would be a prophetic word for the future, all in one, right there. His message to them would not be some statements that he had prepared to read, some statements he had, had prepared in advance to read to them, but rather his mind right there on the spot. His mind is filled with the past and the present of things that's happened, and his focus is on the future uh, state concerning the promises of God. He's, and, it, and that's that's the frame of mind in which he deals with his sons. He addresses his sons. He does so in the language of faith. He speaks of the future with the purpose of God in mind. And he is carried away by thoughts of the great things God will do for his heritage according to the promises of God. You see, this is Jacob, how he's thinking on his deathbed. And as Jacob finishes with his seventh pronouncement, of uh, his, of his pronouncement on Dan, which took place in the 17th verse, he is stirred by the realization of what lies ahead for his offspring as he's recounting all of these things, the opposition and the dangers and, and, the, and the troubles they'll face. And it's probable that while he was thinking about all these things, he probably came to his mind that uh, how utterly impossible it would be for, for, uh, for them with all the things that they were going to face and that it, uh, and how dim the prospects of the future would, would be if God was not for them. And it, it was in the course of these blessings, you remember right there in the middle of everything, Jacob, he, he kind of interrupts in the verse 18, and he says, I have waited for thy salvation, O God, right there. And, and he makes that pronouncement in the middle. Now, jo, J, uh, Jacob is lying on his deathbed, but he's not concerned with dying. He, he's, he's, uh, he has the presence of mind to instill in those his, his brethren there confidence in God and in the promises that he's given them. Jacob projects his own confidence in God for the future among his brethren and the generations of Israel by saying, I have waited on thy salvation, O God. This is the same Jacob that said, God was in this place, and I knew it not, but here he is, and, and you see how he's, he's dealing with, with the future. For it's setting his, what he's doing is setting his sons up to see that, for, have a confidence in the promises God has given them. Amen. Now, this is the trait of great men of God. You, Jesus, our Lord, you know, he was, he was uh, when he departed from this world, uh, and this is the way I, I want to leave this world, too, and, and that's the way all of you, brethren, want to leave this world. Jesus was more concerned with his brethren than he was with the impending sufferings and the cross he was about to face. And so this is the posture, you see. This is how strong faith can be. This, this is how, you know, uh, staunch the faith, faith can be. And, uh, and, and then at the same token, this, this is a cry of faith mm -hmm. for God. I have waited in my salvation, oh, oh God. Brethren, uh, I think Abraham... Uh, was saying the same thing throughout his whole life. Oh, Lord, I have waited for thee. In the 24th chapter of Genesis, we have this account. Sarah has passed from this world already, and Abraham, being well stricken in age, the Scripture said, he considers the marriage of Isaac. Abraham was emphatic, if you'll remember. A wife for Isaac, Isaac should not come from the people of Canaan. Although Abraham lived and he dwelt in the midst of these people, Abraham was separated from them because he knew they were a people destined for destruction. So he didn't socialize with them. Abraham said, bring a, wo a woman from my people to Isaac, but whatever you do, don't take Isaac from this land. Now, the reason's in verse 7. This is what the Lord, the Lord of God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swore unto me, saying, Unto thy seed I will give this land. He, sh he shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. That was what Abram said about it. Abraham was waiting on the deliverance God had promised. Now, uh, God had confirmed his promises to, to Abraham in such a way that produced hope in him. That was, a, that was a result of it. Abraham was concerned for the future seed and this, and the promise of, uh, hope of this, uh, this promise. And he was taking care of business. He's taking, taking care of that. He was doing what he could do to secure every blessing for Isaac. 
He was making sure Isaac was in the right place, waiting on the deliverance of God. Abraham knew that this land had been given to the future generations as an inheritance. And Isaac couldn't leave. Isaac couldn't leave the land. Uh, he couldn't leave without leaving the inheritance, you see. So in every, uh, so in every instance, God uh, insisted that a woman be brought to him. All through his life, see, this was the manner of Abraham, waiting on God to show him the way. He waited on Isaac to be born. And he waited, he waited there on that mount for God to provide a sacrifice, didn't he? Yeah. Abraham saw God as, uh, as one who was utterly reliable mm -hmm. yes. and steadfast. He waited on God to deliver. Mm -hmm. Now, God is the great deliverer. This is an essential theme in the message of the prophets. That, and God wanted to be seen as the deliverer. Remember, uh, remember Noah. I bring him to your attention. He found favor in the sight of God. Noah, with his family, after so long a time, he emerges from the ark. And while looking toward heaven, he prepares to build an ark to God, a memorial to the deliverance of, of the Lord. Noah waited on the salvation of God. You can think in your own mind, brethren, how many testimonies in the record do we have of, of the godly of the godly men and the upright men who, who uh, waited on God is making these same declarations of their steadfastness and faith in him. Amen. In a very severe trial and a major onslaught of Satan, Job waited on the salvation of the Lord. Now, these are declarations of patience and long-suffering and endurance. Mm -hmm. It's uh, outstanding of the men of God. And these are the things that God has recorded the testimony in his word. Jeremiah said, it's good that a man should both hope mm -hmm. and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Amen. Now, the opposition against us is mighty, but God is almighty, brethren. Right. Yeah. Now, let's contrast this waiting for salvation and this quietly and patient waiting for salvation with the wicked. In Isaiah 57, 20, we have this word, but the wicked are like the troubled sea mm -hmm. when it cannot rest whose waters cast up mire and dirt. They cannot wait. The wicked cannot wait. The ever-moving, restless sea that cannot rest. This is the way of the wicked. Mm -hmm. They cannot rest. They can never be at rest. See, it's not in them. Always in motion, tossing about like the waves. They can't be at peace. They have neither, neither rest nor calmness in their soul. The wicked are overcome by anxiety and fear. Mm -hmm. and the raging passions that control them, their guilty conscience, and their trouble with fear of death and judgment. So they cannot rest. They cannot have peace. But the people of God are not like that. See, we're not like that. Uh, Psalm 62, 6, it says it for us. My soul, wait thou only upon God. My soul, be silent before, before God. See how, how quietly the man of God can rest. These are the words of faith. These are the word. This is what well, faith will enable us to say these things. And well, I have waited on thee, O God. Now God has established the fact that He is a deliverer, and that we can wait on Him, and we can have peace in Him. How about this word? As birds flying, so will the Lord of Hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also, He will deliver it, and passing over, He will preserve it. God can deliver, and none can take out of, out of his hand, and none can stop him. Mm -hmm. He says this, Yea, before the day was, I, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Now, God shows himself as the great deliverer because men need deliverance. Mm -hmm. Our need for salvation and our need for deliverance. See, God has shown himself to be this deliverer. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it occurred to me as I was preparing this that uh, we have so many that so this whole world and we talked about it this morning that needs to be delivered and, and you know before we, a man can be delivered he must need to see that he needs delivering mm -hmm. unto right. salvation he needs, to be, he needs to see that he needs to come face to face that he needs to be delivered it's really must be shown to man you know, our, our first aim, or we should not go about trying to educate men, for example, about probably about the unseen world 
of something of this nature, but the, the, the wickedness of Satan in his, in his devious manner because until a man has been delivered and been born again, he really can't receive these kind of things. It's a waste of t our time to lecture about it to, to them who hasn't been delivered first. It's enough to know. It's enough that they know that God can deliver men. And we must present that message of deliverance. I doubt we really need to convince men that, that they are sinners. Uh, men already know they're not right with God. They just need to be reminded. We need to remind them that they're sinners. And, uh, and we can do this because when men are confronted with Jesus Christ, when men are confronted with the righteous one of God, the sinless one, then they are, they are, they are convicted of their sin. When they see the light of Christ, when he shines on men, they'll see they're in darkness. That's why wicked men, that's why they kill the Lord of glory because they, that was their attempt to remove the light that was shining on them. And the scriptures say it, it just says it straight out, and this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. Jesus is the light of men. John act, actually says it this way, in the eloquent style of the Spirit, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, the light in particular that men don't want shining on them is, of course, this is the light of Jesus. It shines in the heart, and, 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 it, and, and, and uh, it allows men to be able to see him. Jesus is exactly, this light is exactly what men need because men need life because they're dead. Men need life because they're in darkness, and they need the knowledge of God because men are ignorant. They don't know God. It must be shown to men that they need deliverance and that they need salvation. Three things. A man must realize their need for deliverance. He must desire it. And he must know from where salvation comes. You know, you think about it. Woe to anyone. Woe to me. If I, if I lose my awareness of my own need for salvation, or if I lose my desire to be saved, or if I lose my point of reference in salvation, if I, if I, uh, in, who was in Christ Jesus, if I, woe to me if any of these things happen to me. Uh, this message of salvation then is uh, and deliverance is for all men, all times. It rescues those who come to Christ. It keeps those who come, and it reproves those who refuse uh, to come and who love the darkness. You know, uh, these things are. Are, are, we speak these quite fluidly. We, we say these things easily, but these things are not commonly said or are, are commonly heard uh, outside this, this group. And uh, there, could be a, there, there couldn't be a more critical time uh, in the time we live to say these things and for these things to be fresh in our minds. Uh, today, I, I think sometimes we could be in the last period of our time, the, 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 the condition of the situation we live in. Um, I, for too long, and, and, and we, we're reaping the benefits of something that's, that, has, that we've inherited. It's, it's for too long, the great majority of preaching, um, we've been preaching a gospel of Jesus Christ, but we've been doing it for the long, wrong reason. We've, we've been using the gospel to, to bring people in for our memberships and things of this nature, you see. And these things have been wrong. Uh, we know that the gospel is not about these things, but the gospel is about deliverance of men and about salvation. And, and, uh, and, and we, look, we look at the mess that we're in today. So uh, we want to be, be quick to stand up to any kind of compromise now. Uh, yeah. and, and so that the gospel will be go out. we got so many who's not doing this. Uh, the gospel that men are preaching is, is no longer a gospel of Jesus Christ of good news. There's really not anything good in it at all. Um, for those who see this thing, it's just been an awful lesson to learn that the truth, you mix it with anything, uh, any kind of motive, any other kind of motive or any other kind of agenda, uh, it corrupts it. Right. It corrupts the gospel and corrupts the word of God and it, it robs us of its power. Yeah. And God leaves and he takes the power with him and this happens anytime God uh, men put the tool of God to the work of God and salvation is the work of God he is doing it 
And so that man can't boast in it, you see. Um, and you know something else, brother, and I know you've noticed this, and we've talked about this today. But in these times, when we've got, a, we've got a false message going out, and it brings no real deliverance, and it brings no salvation to men, it just wraps them up in some, something that's just false. And, it, and especially in this time, and especially in this wicked time in which we live. I mean, we live in a, in a wicked time like no other time. Now, there's been generations in the past where we've seen sporadic things, but the wickedness that we're seeing in these last times has even caught the attention of the world. They're commenting on the wickedness that's, that we're seeing. We're, we're reading about wickedness in our own families. It's not ever been, you'd never hear such a, uh, things like this taking place. And, and uh, there's never been such an outbreak of killing and murdering and things that's going on in our, in our world. And the rate at which this world is declining, and, and it's just absolutely astounding. And, you know, for the saints now, we take these things in stride. We do because we know that God is managing these things, and God is at the helm, and he's directing the affairs of men. Amen. And so we can say that something like Jesus said, and we can take this as it's like, it's an affirmation. Of, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. This is our study. On the final day when all the wicked have been removed, the scriptures say, then shall the righteous shine forth as a sun in the kingdom of their Father who hath ears, let him hear and this will not be the first time the saints begin to shine while, while we've been shining all along. When the Spirit began to move among the early brethren, he found the willingness of Stephen to shine, and Stephen shined. And yes, we have the Spirit. We have that same Spirit here in our assembly. Those right here in our midst who are ready to give an account of what God is doing, of, of God's salvation, of the God's good news in Christ Jesus, ready to preach the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and, and just for no other reason than to proclaim the glory of God. See, that should be our only reason for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you mix it with anything, with anything else, you've corrupted it. Yeah. Amen. The disciples turned the world upside down for the glory of God. They said, for we cannot but speak the things which we've seen and heard. Mm -hmm. Now, these are the kind of good work salvation will work in men. And they're not, these, these good works are not on the order of commandments of men. They're not on the same order of these. Amen. The scripture says, and therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you. That he, uh, therefore he will be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Amen. Blessed are they that wait for him. Amen. This verse speaks of salvation, of a God who desires to save, and of a people who are blessed that wait for that. God who doesn't have to wait now, he waits. However, God's waiting is on a different order than our waiting. God's wait so he may be gracious. We wait because we're recipients of that grace. We're, we're getting those things. Three things to see about God right here. God waits. God will be exalted. And God is a God of judgment. Now we can say for the record is plain in this regard, the main work of God is so that in the end, so that in the end, he will be seen for who he is. He will be seen for the almighty, sovereign God that he is. God will be seen all surpassing, having the absolute preeminence. Preeminence. He will be exalted. Actually, God has always been exalted. Every time he has shown himself and revealed himself, he was immediately exalted. If God was to reveal himself here tonight at this moment, he would immediately, without hesitation, be exalted by the world. When God came down on the mount there in the wilderness, the mountain shook and the earth quaked, fire erupted, men feared and trembled. God was exalted. This was the result. Each and every instant when the power of God was displayed against the enemy, God was exalted. And when the earth was flooded with water, and all, while all living things were destroyed, the ark floated safely on the water. God was exalted. Pharaoh of Egypt, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, Tower of Babel, King Herod, Psalm 46.10. Be still and know I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Yeah. 
So then, whether God will be exalted or is not really a question, uh, is how he will be exalted. And this is what God has calculated. He has calculated this, see. He will be exalted like he wants to be. And this, of course, how God will be exalted is to be taken personally. It is God's intention to be gracious to men, and therefore he waits. Now, my sense of this verse, real quick, uh, summarize is the exaltation, of God, the exaltation of God will be seen through his mercy and grace toward humanity, to all men. Although God could easily and justly exalt himself in power and majesty all at once, if there's any doubters, God done this in the flood. He destroyed the world. How quickly he did, and then he saved at the same time. God chose, God chooses to wait in grace and mercy. Now, in the end, we know that God will be exalted by all creation because of the sudden destruction of the earth. This will be the ultimate attention getter for the flesh. This 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 end, this exaltation of God. But it'll be too late then. God in the end will be exalted. And he'll be praised throughout timeless ages for his wisdom, grace, and mercy. And we know that God can only receive, and he'll only receive this, praise from those who can truly understand it. That's what this is all about. Those who have personally tasted of it, and those who have firsthand knowledge of his wisdom, grace, and mercy. All those creatures, without doubt, will acknowledge the sovereignty of God, his wisdom, and his grace and his mercy. Only the saints will be able to sing the song of deliverance, you see. Only, uh, only the saints will have firsthand knowledge of God's judgments. For his judgments will have flown out of his, his wisdom and his grace and his mercy. And no creature will be able to dispute them. Uh, because he'll have the body of Christ there as a testimony and a record to them. The whole body of Christ will be present to give witness and account for the blessed are those who wait for them. You see, we will say, I have waited for thy salvation, O God. Now, isn't this the stance of those who are being saved? That they, are having, that they have an awareness that, that they need saving? Without this knowledge, how can anyone make a claim on God? And on the final day, the saints will shout in midair, this is our Lord. We have waited for thee. Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. How true those words are. A man's need for deliverance and salvation. Now they will compel him. And he will desire and he will want it. Only God can satisfy these things that he's, he's put in the man. And only God you see, in this verse, God is waiting. And as you look at this verse as we have tonight, that you see that this waiting is a productive waiting. It's just not simply waiting. That's right. um, now, while he works salvation upon the face of the earth, see, that's, what he's wait that's why he's waiting. He's got a certain work and a certain purpose that he's doing. And that's, that's why he's waiting. And brethren, as we are co-laborers with God, as we join with the Lord, we're also waiting for him. We're waiting for him to work out this salvation and this purpose for us and for our brethren. And so we pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we can, we can pray with understanding because we we're waiting on God because of what he's doing. And we know that what God is doing is a great, it's a great thing. And so, you know, we can say in this, as the scriptures say, we can say, even come. So, uh, even come, Lord. Thank you, brethren. Amen. Amen. Amen.